I'm excited to share something new for you. And let me just say, as I share this particular series with you, it's going to be a couple of weeks. Don't say, well, I know that. I'm going to just, I'm, I'm good. I can promise you there's something you have not heard before in this area. And if I do something every month or every week or whenever I do, you take communion, I don't want to just do it haphazardly. I don't want to go through the motions. I want to see fruit from what I'm doing. And so we want to talk for a couple of weeks about what I call the cup of blessing. And there are some things that are scriptural and important to us, but sometimes we can simply go through the motions because we don't really have an understanding or a revelation of those things. How many of you would agree with this? Virtually every Christian church that I know of worldwide partakes of communion. Pretty much every church I've ever been to. Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Charismatic, Messianic Jewish churches. We all enjoy the Lord's Supper. Now, we might do it a little bit differently from place to place, but the reality is we all embrace this. And most churches recognize two ordinances in the New Testament. Now, what's an ordinance? It's a visual aid to help you to better understand what Jesus accomplished for us at Calvary. But these two ordinances are also commands to be obeyed. Now, the first one is water baptism. How many of you know the Great Commission says you're to go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And we know much about that. We love water baptisms. But the second ordinance is what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. Now, here's my question. What is an ordinance? There are three qualities that characterize these ordinances. Number one, they were instituted by Jesus. Secondly, they were taught by the apostles. And number three, they were practiced by the early church. Instituted by Jesus, taught by the apostles, practiced by the early church. And so, for the reasons stated above, there are other things that we do as believers that are fully scriptural, but they're really not ordinances. Let me give you a couple of examples. The Bible talks about foot washing. We did that a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night. Anointing with oil, the laying on of hands, baby dedications, weddings, funerals, etc. All of those things are good, that they are not ordinances, they are biblical practices. Does that make sense? There are many biblical practices, but there are two ordinances. Now, there are a couple of differences between water baptism and communion. First of all, water baptism is typically done only one time in a believer's life. Now, sometimes people get rebaptized because they were children when they had it happen the first time and it didn't mean as much, but generally people get baptized once, maybe twice at best. But communion can be taken literally hundreds of times in our lives. Also, water baptism has one element. What do you think that is? Water. Communion has two, bread and wine. Now, the Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus himself. And we know when that took place. That was at the Passover, right before he passed on to glory because of the cross. And so it's found in Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, and Luke's gospel. John never mentions it, but three different passages talk about the Lord's Supper. Now, there's another phrase for communion, and I like this, and I named the series after this, and it's called the cup of blessing. How many of you like blessing in your life? 
So 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17 say this, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So that's obviously talking about communion. It's called the cup of blessing. When you leave the communion table, whether at a church or at home, you should be blessed because it's the cup of blessing for the believers. But then notice this, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of that one bread, another translation, the one loaf. Notice the word one, one bread. One body, one loaf. I don't know about you, but many times I see that the body of Christ is very divided. On YouTube, there's someone that doesn't like anyone but they and their few people, and they're criticizing everyone preaching. And, and there's a place to address heresy or major false doctrine, but we should not have constant fights with people on one side of an aisle or the other. How many of you know we have different views on many Bible subjects, but we are still one body? We're not going to get to heaven and say, oh, you believe in this? Okay, you're on this street then. Oh, you believe then that oh, you're down here with the people that saw it just like you. It's not going to be that way. So listen to this. As believers, we have so many different opinions and perspectives on things. But we have more in common that we sometimes realize. And we all partake of one loaf of bread. That is Jesus, the bread of life. So no matter who you are or where you are, when you are with your brothers and sisters in Christ, you don't spend your time talking about your differences. We spend our time saying we are one body and Jesus is one loaf. Now, it's called several things in the Bible. It's called communion in this passage. In chapter number 11, it's called the Lord's Supper. It's called breaking bread in the book of Acts. And it's called the Eucharist by some. How many of you have heard that phrase, the Eucharist? What in the world is a Eucharist? Well, it actually comes from a Greek phrase, and it means to give thanks. Jesus blessed the bread and gave thanks. Listen to this verse. Mark 14, 23 Jesus took the cup when he had given thanks. That's the Greek word from where we get Eucharist. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. So in communion, there should be the element of God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for my salvation. I thank you for the goodness of God in my life. Now, who is communion for? Communion is for believers only. Now, can an unbeliever take communion? Well, it really won't mean anything to them. They can, but they really should first get born again. So it really is for believers but we have to be careful because sometimes we'll divide ourselves and say, well, this group can have communion, but that group can't. Dr. Lester Sumrall was a powerful pastor and apostle. He was mentored under Smith Wigglesworth. And for about 60 years, he traveled the world preaching all over the nations. And he said this, once I preached for a church in Ireland. He said, I ministered to them for an entire week. On Sunday morning, I was the one who preached. But when they took Holy Communion, they told me to sit in the corner. I could not receive it with them because I did not belong to that local body. He said, but I've preached to you all week. The people have loved my preaching and my teaching. Many people have been won to the Lord for the church this week. But they answered, we're sorry. You cannot receive Holy Communion with us 
because you do not belong to our church. The Lord's Supper does not belong to an individual church. Remember, it's the Lord's Supper. And He invites everyone who calls on His name. So I don't care what your background or your denomination, when we have the Lord's Supper, the only question is, are you saved? If you are, it is open to you because He is your bread of life. Now there's an entire portion of of 1 Corinthians that talks about communion, and we'll just touch on a couple of these things, but let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it's good to read this in your own Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, whether that's on your phone or a physical Bible. But let me give you a breakdown of this chapter. In verses 1 through 16, we have men and women and their roles in marriage in the church. So it talks about men and women, their roles in the church. But in verses 17 through 34, we have an understanding of communion and how to partake properly. Now, Paul begins this chapter by praising the church at Corinth. Look at verse 2. Now, I, what's the phrase there? Praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. In other words, remember my teaching and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. I thought we didn't believe in traditions. Now, we don't believe in the traditions of men, but there are some good traditions. Brushing your teeth is a good tradition. Getting a shower is a good tradition. And there are some biblical traditions that we need to hold on to. How many of you know in our culture, every tradition is being challenged, being overturned? So as a believer, there are traditions that we need to say, we will not swerve. This is the word of God, and whatever the world does, we stay with God's word. And so Paul said, I praise you because you hold on to the traditions, the teachings I gave you. But then when it came to communion, Paul could not praise them. Verse 17 Now, in giving these instructions about communion, I do not praise you, since you come together, uh, not for the better, but for the worst. You see, they had something that was called a love feast. And what that was, was simply they would come together before communion, the rich and the poor, they would fellowship, They would have a meal together. Afterwards, they had communion. But the rich would bring food and eat it by themselves. And the poor went away hungry. This was anything but a love feast. So here's what Paul said. Verse 20. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now let me just explain that. It should have been but it wasn't their motivation. They came just to take care of themselves and their own. He said, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So at the beginning of the chapter, he said, I praise you for holding to the biblical traditions I gave you. But in regard to communion, I cannot, I do not praise you. I did some research. The early church had no church buildings. And Sunday was not a day off. It was their custom to gather on Sunday evenings in the homes of the wealthier members to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Their worship was preceded by a potluck supper called the Love Feast. 
How many of you know after church, we have a love feast? So we understand that principle. The problem in Corinth was the wealthier members got theirs first with sumptuous dinners, and they gorged themselves. So when the slaves and other people arrived, the food was gone. Even worse, a few of the wealthy people filled their wine glasses a bit too often, and they were getting drunk. That's why we use juice. And as a result, they completely missed the significance and the purpose of the Lord's Supper. Now, this is really a great thought. Communion levels the playing field. Communion levels the playing field. What does that mean? It is available to rich and poor. Men and women. Educated and uneducated. Black and white, or whatever skin color you have. Moral and even immoral. You mean an immoral person can take communion? Absolutely. They're the ones that can get things right in the presence of the Lord. So it's a level playing field. Now let's continue on with this. Paul basically said at the end of the chapter, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Don't just take care of your own. If you're really hungry, let them eat at home. This is not designed to be your main course. It is a time for the fellowship of the saints. Rich with poor, black with white, educated with uneducated, etc. And then Paul said this, For I received from the Lord, verse 23, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, the Eucharist, he broke it and said, Take, eat, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, Till he comes. Sometimes people say, Pastor, how often should we take communion? Well, there's no command in the scripture. The early church broke bread regularly. At the end of the book of Acts, we have Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, what day would that be? Sunday. On the first day of the week, We gathered, Paul said, with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. So it was done on a regular basis, even on a weekly basis for some. Now, there is no specific time to take it, but the Bible says when you do it, do it in remembrance of me. I've been in churches that took it every single week. Nothing wrong with that. But if we're not careful, it just becomes a ritual or a routine. I see others that only do it about once a quarter, and if that's the case, it gets pushed away into a corner. I'll be honest, we have not done as much communion as we should have because of COVID. People were so afraid of getting COVID by passing elements and so forth. But we're going to get back to this. Because like water baptism... It is an ordinance of Jesus. And more than just something we're we're commanded to do, there's life in communion. It's called the cup of blessing. You cannot be but blessed when you partake of the Lord's Supper. Now we know that there are two elements, and we'll get into this next week. There is the wine, and there is the bread, And the purpose of the wine or the juice is it's a symbol of Jesus' blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness or remission. The purpose of the bread 
It's by his stripes you are healed. And in fact, remember when Jesus ministered healing and deliverance to the Syrophoenician woman? He called healing the children's bread. So two elements, two purposes. As we partake, we are to look in four directions. First of all, we are to look back. Look back. Through communion, we acknowledge that Jesus died for you and I. Verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. That's past tense. We look back. When we take communion... We look back at everything Jesus did for us at the finished work of Calvary. So we look back. Secondly, we look ahead. Through communion, we acknowledge, listen to me, that Jesus is coming again. Verse 26, you proclaim the Lord's death Past tense, till he comes, future tense. So we look back, and then we look ahead. I don't know about you, but the crazier the world gets, the more I'm saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I love life most days, but I'll be glad to hear the sound of the trumpet. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Really, there are two comings the Bible talks about. At Jesus' first coming, he wore a crown of thorns. At his second coming, he'll wear a crown of glory. In his first coming, he was brought before Pilate and he was dragged before Herod. But the next time he comes, Pilate will be brought before Jesus, and Herod will be dragged before him. They, like the rest of humanity, will bow before the king of the Jews and confess, you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. So very simply, we begin by looking... We look back. Thank you. Then we look ahead or forward. Thirdly, we look within. Let a man examine himself, verse 28, and let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. It's a time to say, Lord, I judge myself. Is there anything in my life that I need to confess before you? Many years ago, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, had a woman walk up to him and say, Mr. Wesley, my talent is to speak my mind. And he said, I'm sure, sister, that God would not object if you buried that talent. When we come to communion, we're not focused on what someone else did. We're focused on what we might have done. Lord, search my heart. And then the Bible says in verse 27, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. I've had people say, well, I cannot take communion because I am unworthy. But that's not what the Bible is talking about. Listen to me. In one sense, all of us are unworthy. But if you know Jesus, you've been made unworthy the righteousness of God. He makes you worthy. So if you're a Christian, you're not unworthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. What it is saying is we should not partake in an unworthy manner. We need to examine ourselves and say, Lord, what do I need to get right with you? And then lastly, we are to look around. What do you mean by that? 
we need to recognize and esteem the whole body of Christ. A lot of people don't do that. We have our camp, but our camp has truth. I come from a word of faith camp, and I'm grateful for that but it's a small sliver and a big piece of pie in the body of Christ. And I'm grateful for every denomination, every movement, every organization that is preaching Jesus. Did you know that you can and should learn from the entire body of Christ? There are things we have and know but there are things other people know. They might have a different title. They might have a different slant. But they're in the body of Christ, and we need them so desperately. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 12, Paul said, Some of you were saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos. Or I follow Peter. And then the real spiritual ones, well, I follow only Christ. We have that today. I follow this preacher. Now they say, well, I follow that one. We run with this particular tribe. Now there's nothing wrong with that because we're all wired differently. We all have our favorites. But listen to me. We need to receive from and embrace the whole body of Christ. I can feel the love right there. It doesn't mean that you agree with everything, but they're part of the body like we are part of the body. No one person, no one tribe or camp will have the full counsel of God, but collectively, we, the body of Christ, have the mind of Christ. So we look back. We look ahead. We look within. And we look around. I close with this. Heidi Baker, wonderful woman of God, ministers in Mozambique, Africa. Powerful woman. And I listened to her testimony on a podcast. And she ministers in a very difficult portion of Africa. And she was in a service, and she's really hungry for the presence of God. And so she had a service where the presence of God was so strong and God was ministering to people that were there and they have a lot of believers, but they have unbelievers that come in. And sometimes they have people from different languages. So not only will they have an interpreter, when I preached in Pakistan today, there was an interpreter, but sometimes they'll have two or three interpreters. Now, what was the game we would play when we would tell something to one person and then they, was it telephone? And by the time it got back around, it was nothing like what you originally heard. Well, that can be the way when it comes to translating from one person to another to another. And so Heidi was either the second or the third interpreter. She was the last interpreter. And there was a woman there sharing her testimony. And then she said this, tomorrow I was going to eat my family. But now, because of my, I have experienced the love and the presence of God here, I'm not going to eat my family. Now, that's not a typical phrase you hear in a testimony service. And so Heidi's thinking, there must have been something lost in that translation. So she said to the interpreter that gave that, ask again, did she just say what I thought she said? He said, she said, tomorrow I was going to eat my family but because, now some of you say, that sounds like a good idea to me. But the reality is she said, because of what God has done today, I'm not going to eat my family. And so she said, you've got to get some clarity. What is she talking about? And the woman said, the witch doctors told her that if she had body parts that were failing, she could eat the body parts of her relatives and get better. In other words, if her eyes were bad, she could eat the eyes of her dead children and then her own eyesight would supposedly improve. What do you expect from a witch doctor, right? But Heidi used that example as a teaching moment. She was talking about her love for the church of God 
And they said, Heidi, in closing this podcast, what would you like to say? And she said this, too many in the church today are eating their own family. In other words, too many are devouring the family of God. And here's what she said in closing. We must stop doing that. We must love his church. Stop eating the family. Well, they don't believe like we do. That's okay. Stop eating the family. Well, they have some things that are wrong. That's not your business. Let's love the family of God. Again, there's a place to deal with error, but a lot of the things we fight over aren't, it's not really error, it's just differences. We'll always have those differences, but we're one body with one Lord and one loaf. Let's not eat the family, let's love the family of God. When we take communion, we're to look back at the cross. We're to look ahead to Jesus' return. We must look within to examine and judge ourselves, and we must look around to recognize the body of Christ. Amen and amen.